So the forum tonight, um, I'll start again, we'll focus on the need for UPC, universal primary care, what has been done and what we need to do. Um, and I'm going to go through, briefly go through the agenda, which um, Mark was going to put up on the screen so we can just walk through quickly. And it's in your chat as well. So we're going to start off with a couple of personal stories. Uh, Mary Chapman, who is the um, vice chair of the Middlebury Democratic Committee, has a story. And Mark Gibson is our vice chair of the Bristol Democratic Committee, is going to give a story. Then Ellen Oxfeld will, um, gonna, is going to go through some very recent data from 2021 from the Vermont Household Health in, in, Insurance Survey. Then we, ha we have two guest speakers, very excited to hear from them. Dr. Deb Richter, she's a private uh, physician in Montpelier. And um, Mike Fisher, I think you all know, is from Lincoln, and he's the Vermont patient advocate. Um, and uh, he was a former Vermont house rep. So then uh, Chris Bray is going to take us into a plan of action and focus legislation. Then um, Ruth Hardy is going to talk about what has happened in the Senate Health and Welfare Committee and what they plan to do. And I asked Mari to come because she was she's in the House Health and Welfare Committee, but she's uh, she's working tonight, so she's unable to come. But we'll hear from Ruth. Then we'll end with uh, Mark Gibson. We'll go through what has been adopted by the Vermont Democratic Party in terms of universal primary care. And then hopefully we'll have a good 20 minutes for um, questions and answers at the end. So, um, Mark, we will start with you. OK, I just want to thank everyone for coming. Um, all right, so we're on to personal stories. And actually, first, we're going to hear from uh, Mary Chapman. who is on mute. Mary, you need to unmute yourself. Uh, Linda, can you unmute Mary? Or yeah. make co -host? I've got it. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Mary Chapman. Um, hi, Cheryl <laughs> and Ellen. Um, I'm going to talk about my older brother, um, who just recently turned 65. Um, but what I meant to first tell a little bit about him, um, we as a family grew up in Virgins and um, I'm not sure when this happened. I think it might've been his junior year. He found a job up in Shelburne and I'm sure some of us, well, some of us probably remember um, Cafe Shelburne and um, he started working in a restaurant and that ended up being his career. He eventually in his early twenties ended up over in Sugarbush. Um, he fell in love with skiing. So he worked at um, a few restaurants around there and um, eventually worked at a restaurant called Old Times and was a chef there for a long time. Um, he did the menu and, and he was over there for about 20 years. Um, he also taught skiing and with kids, which he's a good old Vermonter. It's his favorite stories, but, um, and he also raced. So he did this for like 20 years. Um, I don't remember what happened, but he ended up coming back over to Addison County and lived here for a couple of years. And, um, I worked in a couple of restaurants, but he was working when the incident happened, he was working um, for a contracting mm -hmm. company who were building the new science building and library building at the college. Um, never, he never had insurance. He never could afford it, but he was pretty healthy overall those 20 years. Um, and so this was about 2000. Um, he ended up with a tooth infection and went to a dentist and was put on antibiotics. And he overall started feeling better initially. And um, 
continued working and he kept feeling like maybe at the flu or something, he'd go to the ER. And this went on for months, probably six months until he got to the point where he could no longer work. He had lost like 40 pounds. Um, he had looked for a primary care physician, but no one would take him. Um, finally, my dad talked to um, Don Bicknell, who um, was our family doctor as kids when we were growing up. And um, my dad took him in one week and Don put him on all this medication. What happened, he had gotten septic from the tooth infection. Um, my father brought him in um, a week later, Don called the ambulance and had him rushed to the hospital. He had pleurisy of the lungs and they had to cut him open right there in the ER on both sides just to get the infection out. That's his first incident. Um, he wasn't able to go to work for quite a while. He was in the hospital for probably about a week and a half. Um, they were talking about having to scrape his lungs. The infection was so bad. I, I, anyways, he overcame that and um, ended um, I'm trying to think. It was nine years ago. Um, he was again over in Sugarbush working, and um, it was nine years ago. My mom passed away November 8th, three days after his birthday. He had a heart attack a month later, and um, he was out of work again. Sorry, this is my big brother. So. <laughs> um, he, again, lost his job, lost his place to live, and he ended up staying with my sister that time. The, when he had the pleurisy, he came and stayed with myself and my daughter. And um, the last incident was when COVID hit. It was right when you guys all shut down. And um, they have a lot of foreign students that work at Sugarbush. Um, so all those guys had to leave. I mean, places where countries were closing down. So he was left cleaning up the kitchen himself. And he was feeling, he wasn't feeling well again. He didn't, he thought it was COVID. Um, and I didn't hear much about it after that um, with him. He's proud old Vermonter. So um, I'd hear a little bit here and there. It was December um, when he had finally gone to his, he does have a primary care. And when he saw him, he'd pay out of pocket because he does have a heart condition. He has to take meds and he was paying out of pocket for those. Um, so when he, he finally went to his primary care he had to go to Porter to get a CAT scan and um, he had stage two lung cancer and at the time we went to Burlington I went with him um, his spot in his lung was um, eight centimeters big so Surgery wasn't an option. Um, he is a smoker and has always smoked. Um, so yeah, if he, I, and I know this is about primary care, but I'm gonna go back to the tooth infection. We've all had them, you know, a primary care can take care of a tooth infection. I can't imagine what, that cost. I've had, had my own health care healthcare um, stuff going on, and I've had several CAT scans when I've had no regular health insurance, so I know what they cost. And um, if if on a practical level. 
what it's costing the state for what my brother has gone through medically is, it, to me, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, those are astronomical costs. A heart attack, um, pleurisy of the lungs, and now he goes to, he gets treatment every three months and waits three months and goes for a CAT scan. He's on disability now. And, um, and that went through because it's on his records that if he didn't have it, he'd, he'd be dead. The tumor, tumor has um, shrunk down to two centimeters and he's doing okay. Um, at least what he tells me. So that's his story. So thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you, Mary. Um, thanks for sharing that. Um, all right, I'm just going to uh, share um, my my little story, which isn't um, nearly as intense, but uh, just maybe slightly interesting. Um, I uh, in <laughs> interestingly, it's also about. Uh, pleurisy. I uh, woke up one morning with a chest pain, went off to Porter um, for 20 minutes, was there for 20 minutes. They took some blood tests. Uh, and the way they uh, figured out it was pleurisy is the blood tests showed, didn't show things coming from uh, chemicals that would be in the blood for uh, a heart attack. Um, so, and then it, it, I guess if you catch pleurisy early enough, it's um, the treatment is, it's just, it's, it's a big, it's an inflammation. So treatment was a bunch of ibuprofen. Um, and then I got, you know, a month later, I got the bill is $1,700 for these few blood tests. Um, I have a $10,000 deductible. So 1700 was out of, was out of pocket. And uh, which is what we're talking about in the underinsured in, in Vermont, which is, is not abnormal. Um, I, I pay for for this ten thousand dollar deductible plan. I, I pay uh, over five thousand a year. Uh, that's for my family, and uh, my company pays over ten thousand a year. So um, if I use uh, most or all of that deductible, um, the health health. Uh, uh, my insurance company, Cigna, gets 15000 between me and my company, and the hospitals get 10000 out of my pocket. And it isn't until after, of course, I get past the 10000 that the health insurance company starts paying for any of that. Um, so that's just my little story. So uh, let's move on to Ellen. Great. Well, um, neither of those is just so little of a story. And obviously, in both cases, um, these high out-of-pocket costs are a great deterrence to people seeking the health care they need. So I'm just going to share. Um, I'm a little bit less with a personal story, but I, I have a couple of statistics that I wanted to share with you. And you all can get um, all the material from this. This is a 2021 survey, so the latest uh, material on Vermont. And apropos Mark's story, and Mary, your story about your brother, because you know he he hesitated to go in for treatment um, because of the out-of-pocket costs. Um, so um, how how common is that for Vermonters? Well, according to the survey, official Vermont survey from 2021, 44% uh, of privately insured Vermonters are under, under age 65 or underinsured. That's a huge number of people. And by the way, um, the, the surveyors used um, a measure of underinsurance that comes from um, the Commonwealth Fund. So, you know, it's all kind of vetted and, and it's not like they just pull it out of their pocket. It's a huge number of people. How many people is that? Well, it's 187,800 Vermonters. 
There are only what, 650,000 of us in the state. Um, and so 180, over 187,000 of us are underinsured. This means that uh, the cost of their health care, whether it's from deductibles, whether it like um, Mark had or out-of-pocket expenses or a combination of both deductibles and out-of-pockets is uh, more than they can bear. And thus this leads to people often postponing, delaying, or entirely avoiding uh, needed care. And I just like you to see, I won't take too long, but if you, you look at this, um, this um, graph on the left, you can see that, you know, um, the, the, the rates are actually, I'm going to show you the ne next one. The rates have gone up. Here it is. The rates have gone up over time. So you can see in 2012, 28% of us, this is on the right, if you can see that. In 2012, 28% of all Vermonters under age 65 um, with private insurance were underinsured. That's now 44%. So folks, it's getting a lot worse. In the last 10 years, the number of Vermonters who are underinsured, who are thus are avoiding or delaying uh, care um, is going up. Um, and now it's up to 187,800 Vermonters. If you add the 34,000 Vermonters on Medicare who do not have a supplemental plan, then that means that to the ranks of the underinsured, that's 200,000 Vermonters underinsured. So, you know, we just need to think about that. Another 3.5% of Vermonters are uninsured, right? They have no insurance. They might be sort of in the category, Mary, that, you know, your brother was in. Um, but that's only a little bit. There's a lot more people who are underinsured, which means they're not also not getting the care they need. I think I just have one more slide and then I want to hand it over to Mike and Deb who are, uh, you know, <laughs> have much more credentials here to talk about this. Um, but this is, um, this is the uh, ranks of people over age 65 um, who do not have a Medicare supplemental. That's 31% of those um, over age 65. So it's a lot and lot of people, 200,000 people. And finally, um, I think this is my last slide. This also comes from, and I'll put up in chat the link to the full survey. They're, they're like 180 slides, but um, fear of debt leads 40% of underinsured and even 30% of not underinsured Vermonters to not seek medical care. So basically because of the kind of experience that happened, let's say to you, Mark, uh, often many people just simply don't seek medical care. They're afraid of um, getting a bill for $1,700 or $2,000. Uh, so they don't seek the medical care um, that they need. Oh, whoops, that's, that's gonna be for Deb. So um, I'll bring up that again. Uh, so that's basically um, what I wanted to review very briefly. And I will put up in chat um, in a moment, um, just the um, the link to um, to that entire survey, um, which you know is rather sobering to read, but it should uh, should make all of us uh, think twice. Um, so I'm going to put this up in chat. Mark, can I say something real quick? Um, it was me, Mary. Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> The problem is I was one of those people that had to get medical coverage, ended up with $20,000 of debt and homeless. So wow. just thought I'd throw that in there. It's an important point. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, okay, I, I, Ellen, thank you. And uh, let's move on to Deb. It's crazy. Very good. Thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. I'm actually a family physician and also an addiction medicine specialist. And I, I must say, Ellen presented the data on the number of un, underinsured Vermonters. And, but in my primary care practice, um, I, I see basically the reality of those numbers. And I think a lot like um, 
you know, Mary's story of her brother and herself, actually, um, people rationing their own care due to cost. Um, some of these underinsured patients, again, have $12,000 deductibles. And if you have a chronic illness, you meet that, you have to meet that deductible every single year before you get a dollar's worth of coverage. And on top of that, you pay, patients are often paying for the, you know, the premium themselves. Um, and so what they do is they suffer delayed diagnosis, like Mary's brother. Uh, they don't come in for blood pressure checks on a regular basis the way they're supposed to. They don't come in for diabetes checks. Um, they wait with festering abscesses, they ra raging fevers, chest pain. I've had patients wait even with chest pain at home, shortness of breath that clearly um, were actually medical emergencies, um, and they've waited. Um, some have, and again, their health care worsens and some die, and they're clearly much more expensive as Mary's brother, um, that situation, where if we had treated them earlier. Um, and again, most of these people are insured, but they are underinsured. So basically underinsured or not uninsured for the first 10 or $12,000 of their care. Um, you know, I, I would also bring up the whole point that our motto in Vermont is freedom and unity. Um, I also think that, you know, people, I, I see people who stay at jobs, they hate because of health insurance. Um, I've seen people get married because their potential spouse had good health insurance. I've seen people get divorced. That does not define freedom in my mind. Um, an example, I had, a, I had a, a patient who was a diabetic patient. She lacerated her leg. She dropped a water pail on it. And she had, she was not a well person. And she was worried about missing more work. So she went to work that day with this deep laceration. And she waited three days until she finally came in. It was a raging infection. It took about six months for this thing to clear up. Um, Again, she was worried. She went to work because she was worried if she took off more from work, she'd lose her job. If she lost her job, she'd lose her coverage. Many people are trapped in this scenario. And I think to me, the tragedy of, of all of this and many, all these patient stories is that we're already spending more than enough money to cover every single Vermonter. That is not in doubt. Every single study has shown that, that the amount of money that we spend on healthcare every single year is more than enough to cover all Vermonters' medically necessary care, including dental. We could include dental. So Mary's brother could have gotten his tooth taken care of. The problem is we are spending enormous amounts hey, on administrative Turn, off. Turn off that? the music on my earbuds, please. Oh, hey, Siri. So, um, Turn off the music on my earbuds, please. I think we need to mute everything. Playing. Oh, okay. Can you all hear me? Linda, can you mute Alex? Okay. Um, so we're spending all this unnecessary, um, a, a lot of unnecessary money on administrative costs. Ellen, if you could put up this. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, no. Can you unmute yourself, uh, Deb? Yeah, Deb, you're now on mute. Um, since 1970 to the year 2021, we've seen more than a 4,000% increase in the number of administrative Theory. healthcare. At the same time, keep in mind, that's the blue line that, you know, the big blue um, portion here. I don't know, Ellen, maybe you can um, see where the um, the managers are. That's that's the increase in the in the number of managers, a four thousand percent increase since 1970. In the same amount of time, we've only seen a hundred and fifty percent increase in the number of doctors. So clearly, we are spending money where we don't need it. Um, so that's good, Ellen. You can take that down. And one of the reasons that we are spending so much money on administration, which by the way, in total, equals thirty four percent of the healthcare dollar. That's roughly twice what other countries spend on administrative cost. You can't, you know, you have to have administrative costs in the system, but we're clearly spending way more money. And we always seem to be able to find the money to pay for these administrative costs. And yet we can't find a way to pay for many of Vermonters needed medical care. There's something very, very wrong. It's an immoral non-healthcare system. We don't have a healthcare system and it's immoral. But there is another way. Theory? Can you come we on? Know, 
We know that making healthcare universal and simplified. Siri, can you come on? <laughs> Linda, can you you can mute everyone who's not talking, or also make me cut this. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Um, so we know that there's more than enough money in healthcare. That's been shown in every other study. What we need to do is when you make it universal, include everyone and dedicate financing to the necessary services, you greatly simplify administration. And this we know, we've had many studies done in Vermont even, that we could save hundreds of millions of dollars per year that was going for administration that could now go for medical care. This is, so it is not an economic question. We, this, this myth that somehow we can't afford it, we can't afford it, it's a myth, it's not true. And the majority of Vermonters want this, the majority of Americans want it, the majority of doctors want it. There are many polls to show this. It's clearly a political problem. It's not an economic one. So we need to change the politics here. And I think now I'm very, very excited the fact that we now have uh, a veto-proof majority in the House and the Senate in Vermont. What's clear, though, is that doing the whole system at once, we've tried to do that, was too much. It's a big undertaking. That's I'm not going to minimize that. But if we start smaller, which is what we're talking about tonight, we start with primary care. Basically, primary care is most of the care for most of the people most of the time. Everyone needs primary care. The beauty of this and starting with primary care is that it's very inexpensive. It is. It constitutes less than 6% of the total. And that includes mental health and substance use disorder services. So primary care, mental health, and substance use disorder services for less than 6% of the total. If we do this, what do we know? We know all the studies show that it would lower overall costs. When people are connected to a primary care clinician, outcomes are better, people live longer, and quality is better. Again, that is not disputed. Every single, we have and mountains of evidence to show that you look internationally and even nationally that if you if people have access to primary care they live longer outcomes are better overall costs are lower it's also more humane so what what could we do in vermont a universal health care uh, program everyone would get it we'd publicly fund it with no out of pocket costs make it universal again would reduce the administrative costs and you could remove that from the private health insurance premium. So this is also, I might add, because a lot of people say, well, what are you gonna do? We don't, we don't have enough primary care clinicians. This, is, this would be a magnet for primary care clinicians from around the country. Because right now, part of the reason that we don't have enough primary care clinicians, physicians and nurse practitioners, et cetera, is the burnout. And the burnout is a lot to do with the conditions of practice. This would be a magnet. And certainly it would be um, favorable to all Vermonters. Thank you. Deb, thank you. That was great, um, as always. And um, uh, sorry about the interrupts there. Um, and let's now move on to Mike Fisher, who's the Vermont patient advocate and also a former VT house rep. Um, um, so good evening, everyone. Mike Fisher. Um, uh, healthcare advocate, HCA, uh, FYI, um, and um, so I'm, I'm happy to be here and, and speak a little bit about what we see. Um, um, the, the Healthcare Advocates Office runs a helpline, um, and I can't help but resist 917-7787. If you know anybody who's having any kind of problem getting the care they need, I've got a team of advocates who are on the phone every day doing our very best to help people get the care they need. But let me tell you, it's hard. We are a front line, uh, very much in line with the stories you just heard. We are a front line hearing, uh, uh, hearing the challenges that Vermonters face um, in getting the care they need. Um, and, and I'll just focus for a moment. This is not a new thing, but since it was brought up earlier, dental, uh, the glaring, buzzing, flashing red light is access to dental care, um, without a doubt. Um, 
and it is not uncommon that we hear from Vermonters in pain who can't get the care they need. Um, so uh, at some point we decided that it was important for us to develop a storytelling project around, um, around medical debt, um, you know, for years in our advocacy in front of the Green Mountain Care Board um, for the hospital budget process, we've been hearing numbers like $85 million in, in medical debt, that is, that is uh, bills to Vermonters that are unpaid. Um, and, um, and we've been trying to characterize that, trying to understand, I think I know what it means when a Vermonter can't pay their bills, but it, but we have to hear it in their own, in Vermonters' own voices. And this is, this is sort of the, the, the human side of the numbers that Ellen said earlier. Um, so we went out and did a storytelling project, um, and you can see the results of that at vtmedicaldebt.org. Uh, we created a web page that is both an opportunity for people to page through and read what people's words, um, and also enter their own stories. Um, I wouldn't mind, uh, we're sort of relaunching this project. I wouldn't mind help getting that, the word out about that. Um, and you can, you can find a, a nice Facebook post to forward. Uh, 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 our Facebook page is HCA Vermont. Um, so you can find us um, on Facebook and, and you can see our post about this. It's just, it's not within the last couple of weeks. Uh, and forward it. Um, um, we launched that project and, and used that project to advance a um, uh, a bill to improve uh, Vermont's free care, uh, hospital free care policies uh, successfully. Thank you, legislators who are here today. Um, it's going to take another year before it's fully implemented, but it's going to, uh, but I really do believe it represents. Um, millions and millions of dollars of relief for, for Vermonters. Um, hey, anything we can do to improve access, Vermonters access to, to all types of care and, and in particular primary care is a good thing and we support it. Um, and, um, um, you know, many of you know the, the role I played in, in a previous role of my life uh, in working towards passing passing, and then implementing Act 48. Um, and so the much of the conversation and the justification for, this, for the stories that we heard today are, remind me of those times. And the speakers who spoke earlier uh, are right. Um, uh, we, we would be better off with a system that um, financed healthcare differently. Um, I find myself today, and, and, and I'll just say again, I, I'm in favor of and any way we can improve access to primary care. Um, um, I'll, I'll mention that one of the trains that's leaving the station, like it or not, is a movement towards global hospital budgets. And, um, and that may have some opportunities for us. I, I wanna be clear. It, it may be a new administrative uh, regulatory tool and amount to not much in terms of an improvement for access to care, but it may also be an opportunity for us to move some types of care out of the bat bleep crazy hospital uh, healthcare financing system we have and into, um, into a different way of financing care. And so, um, I'll say here the argument that I've been making in work groups, um, we can't make the same mistake that we made with the last all payer model. And that mistake being, um, you know, um, hospital executives and regulators and public policy folks said, uh, hey, Vermont consumers, don't worry your pretty little heads about this. We've got this on the back end payers and providers are going to develop a new relationship about how to finance healthcare and your life will get better. 
they were pretty dismissive, I believe, and my criticism of them is they were pretty dismissive of Vermonters' views and pretty dismissive of, um, of real true engagement um, and, um, and looking for ways to have real deliverables that, uh, that Vermonters would feel as an improvement to our healthcare system. So if we are going to move to a system where hospitals are gonna get say 80% of their financing delivered every two weeks um, as a fixed perspective payment that's not trued up. In other words, we're gonna be giving, if we are gonna to move to a system where we're gonna be giving hospitals um, money in a very different way than through claims, uh, we have to do the work to develop deliverables for Vermonters that they experience as real improvements to care. And without a doubt, access to primary care is one of those that should be explored. Um, and so um, it's, an, it's another angle. Um, it is, I, I, I wanna be clear, not, not anywhere as pure and good as the arguments that Dr. Richter just made, um, but it is a train that's moving. And um, so um, I find myself on health, on, on, um, on work, on work groups and um, trying to bring a consumer's voice to, uh, to those considerations and have it not just be the folks who move money behind the scenes. Um, so I, I think I'll, I'll stop speaking, um, um, but am always happy to, uh, happy to answer questions later and, um, and happy to be a part of this conversation. Thank you, Mike. That was great. Always, and thank you for all your efforts. Um, and let's move on to Senator Chris Bray now. Uh, good evening. Hello to everyone. Lots of familiar faces here. My name is Chris Bray. I'm uh, one of your two state senators, along with Senator Hardy. I live in Bristol, and I first came to the legislature in 2007 when I joined the House, and then um, six years later went to the Senate. Um, I'm also sorry to uh, Mary, to hear your story about your brother and everyone else, or Mark's story. You know, I'm, I'm guessing everyone, many people here on this uh, session probably had some similar discouraging experience where money is getting in the way of providing health care. Um, the other thing I want to do is just pause very briefly before talking about um, plans for uh, legislative plans of action is um, to acknowledge who's with us here with uh, you know, in particular, Deb Richter, Ellen Oxfeld, uh, Linda, and Mike have all spent, uh, if not their entire adult careers in healthcare, uh, much of them. And uh, it's, we have a, a rich base of knowledge and experience to draw on here. So, and I appreciate that we're, hey, here we are in this small county in a small state in the corner of the US and we have great experts in the room to help us out. So we also have, Senator Hardy has uh, served last term on that or currently still a member of health and welfare. So she has um, real world up-to-date inside information on what's happening in the state house. So it's a really great group of people and I'm, I'm thankful people joined the call. Um, the you know, for me, my interest is um, visceral. Uh, my, I'm the son and grandson of physicians, the nephew and great nephew of physicians. Uh, I grew up in a medical family, uh, became an EMT, almost went to medical school myself. Um, you know, the, this work, this kind of care is, you know, it's in my bones. And um, um, uh the, the other thing is, it's these stories are not something here. I sit nice and tidy in a blue blazer and a tie with a fancy title of being a senator, but these are not like a, a, something outside my life experience. You know, I've been as an adult entirely uninsured. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I was a freshman senator, I had kidney stones, went to the hospital, had them addressed, left 10 hours later, along with an $18,000 bill that was uncovered in any way. It was my bill. Um, 
Since then, I've had coverage through Medicaid, uh, and I've also now have it through Medicare. So this is, you know, lived experience for me. I know the strain and stress of, oh, will I go see someone because I don't know if I can afford this right now, or what kind of bill will I get? Can anyone ever tell me ahead of time what my bill might be so I can decide whether or not I can go afford to go see someone? And um, it's it's I'm just saying I'm deeply committed to seeing us improve this most fundamental service um, that we want to provide, I think, uh, as part of living in a compassionate community and state. Um, so for th these reasons, I've been working with uh, folks here on this call and others in the last several months to prepare a universal primary care bill for introduction to the session. I've also worked with the past chair of Senate Health and Welfare, uh, Senator Claire Ayer, who I think probably most everyone here knows well. She was a nurse herself as well as a longtime legislator. I've talked with other members of our Addison County delegation and there's broad support for universal primary care going into session, which is helpful because politics is a team sport. And I've talked with Senate leadership um, and, uh, and our next coming, uh, our very all but certain next uh, Senate President Pro Tem, Phil Baruth, as well as our current chair um, of Senate Health and Welfare, Senator Janine Lyons. So I'm not saying this is a done deal in any way, but there is a, um, um, people are coming together, talking about it, interested and in working on it. And that is a, a great place to start a new session. Um, uh, you know, but I'm only speaking as one of 30 senators and I'm only one of 180 legislators. So, uh, you know, I, I'm hopeful that everyone on this call will stay involved and help bring all the necessary parties inside and outside the state house forward together to do the work. Um, I can't say that we'll, uh, you know, I've been assured we'll sort of get the, the court equivalent, the legal system equivalent of our court and day, an opportunity to make a case, to present data, to have the conversations and look for a solution. I don't ever pretend that a bill is introduced is the answer. Um, it's just a proposal to, be, to convene a working conversation at the legislative le uh, level that will help us learn more together and make decisions together about what we can do. Um, and for those who are really uh, have been working on this issue for years and know details, uh, I, I'm, my starting point is a prior uh, House bill, H276, which had 44 sponsors uh, when it was introduced. So again, a lot of interest and energy behind that version. Um, not wedded to that version, but that's the launching point. Um, the last thing is I want to be realistic. There, there are, of course, there'll be some opponents to this. And from my point of view, you know, I've, uh, everyone here has probably heard this more than once, you know, well, we can't afford this. As Deb was saying, uh, as a matter of fact, um, we can afford it. The, the, um, and then the second thing is, well, we don't know how to operate such a system, even if we wanted to operate system. So I'll start with the second claim. When we don't know how to operate such a system, it's not an exact equivalent, but I'd like to point out that we have, in essence, sort of a UPC program for uh, children and pregnant women in the form of Dr. Dinosaur, which we successfully operated since the 1980s. It's so much a part of our healthcare landscape that people forget what an accomplishment it, it was and is. Um, so I, you know, I feel like we should have some confidence that we know how to do something and get that done. And then the, the, um, the claim that we can't afford it, um, the Richter's already addressed that, but uh, you know, just the, my, my, my way of capturing it is it's about a $7 billion system. And um, that's about the size of the entire state budget. So there is ample money in that system. The question is, how do we deploy it? And with very expensive things like unnecessary amounts of administrative overhead, um, you start freeing up millions and tens of millions of dollars to be deployed in the form of healthcare as opposed to paperwork. Um, and then since um, we're just coming out of an election season, you know, uh, I'll, I was reading, I'm not sure how it came up, but I came across the words of Bobby Kennedy just yesterday. And um, he talked about one of his things was, was some men see things as they are and say, why? 
I dream of things that never were and say, why not? And I really believe that Vermont can see itself a little bit like Bobby Kennedy and say, why not? We have led on so many things. Uh, we just passed a, um, a reproductive rights constitutional amendment uh, this election cycle, and it's um, you know nation leading. So I am, feel like we're humble, we're uh, sober minded, but we also think big. And, um, and I think this is an area where we should really reasonably expect um, more of the system we have because it's not for many people a healthcare system. It's a financing system to help pay for medical expenses when they come up all too often. Um, and so that's, uh, I just, I'll end it there and say, I look forward to working with everyone on this session and others and um, with all of you as partners. And let's see how far we get this session. Thank you, Chris. Great to hear from you. Um, and let's move on to Senator Ruth Hardy. Thanks, Mark. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Ruth Hardy. I am the current vice chair of the Senate Health and Welfare Committee, although um, next session we'll all receive new committee assignments, so I have no idea if I will stay on the Health and Welfare Committee or not. Um, I, sorry, my phone just started ringing. Um, <laughs> I am uh, from East Middlebury, and I I've served in the Senate since 2018. Um, I'm also uh, the former executive director of the Open Door Clinic. Um, that was my first job here in Vermont 20 years ago and served there for three and a half years. Um, so I have heard many stories very similar to the ones that Mary and Mark shared. Um, and as Mike said, I think the thing that we heard the very most at the time was dental, access to dental care. Um, so um, one of the things that Linda asked me to do was to sort of give an overview of some of the things that the Health and Welfare Committee or the legislature as a whole has done over the last few years um, to improve access to primary care. Um, and uh, so... I came up with a top 10 list and Mike, if I've forgotten something, please chime in because Mike follows our work closely. I have him literally on speed dial on my phone um, because we work together very closely. Um, but the very first bill that I introduced and was the primary sponsor of was um, a, a bill uh, to improve access and affordability for dental care. Um, this passed as part of the 2019 budget and it was the largest expansion of access to dental care in 30 years in Vermont um, when this passed. Um, it greatly ex expanded access to dental care. And I have a feeling, Mary, that this had been done when your brother had his dental um, situation, he would have been covered and have, would have been able to see a dentist and have it paid for through VDent. We call lots of things V chip, V whatever. This is V dent, um, and it provides for cleanings and um, preventative dental care and um, primary dental care for um, tooth infections, etc. Et so that was the first thing. Um, I will just run through the rest of the list of these top ten. The second is in 2019, the Freedom of Choice Act. Um, this codified reproductive health care um, as is provided in Vermont in our statutes. And then also the um, Reproductive Liberty Amendment was started in 2019, which um, just passed three days ago. So that was a four, almost five year process. Um, uh, access to reproductive health care is primary care, health, uh, reproductive health care, abortion services, uh, prenatal care, um, maternity services, all of that, um, whether you choose to become pregnant or stay pregnant or not to become pregnant, that is primary care. And we have done a huge amount in Vermont to ensure access to reproductive health care. Um, in 2020, um, COVID hit 
And um, we immediately sprung into action and we passed the most comprehensive COVID emergency health care bill in the country that was used by other states as a model for how the legislature should react to the COVID um, emergency. Um, and it provided a system of supports and flexibility for our healthcare system to enable our hospitals to continue to work, um, to enable our healthcare to con healthcare providers to continue to work during a global pandemic, and to um, provide access to um, comprehensive testing and immunization after those were available. Um, so I just want to remind everybody about the pandemic. This has been huge. Um, uh, barrier to doing a lot of things in the healthcare world because we've literally been trying to just keep our system alive during a pandemic. And Vermont has done that better than pretty much any other state. Um, in 2021, uh, we also created what we called a doctor dinosaur-like program that provided those prenatal um, and uh, child care, uh, child health services to um, women and children who are undocumented. Um, so this was a lot of migrant farm workers um, and others in the state who are here without sort of legal documentation. Um, and this provides the same care that Dr. Dinosaur does for um, people who are um, citizens um, for people who are undocumented. Um, and this was, we were the first state to do this. Um, California was sort of trying to do it simultaneously. Um, and this is a huge expansion of primary care for a very vulnerable population. Um, in 2022, we um, expanded hearing aid coverage. So this is now in our required health plans so that anybody who needs hearing aids um, can um, have access to uh, support for hearing aids through their, um, their health plans. Um, we also passed the telehealth licensure program in 2022. Telehealth expanded a huge amount during the um, pandemic and was one of the primary ways that people accessed healthcare during the pandemic. And we needed to create a system to sort of uh, move telehealth forward in our healthcare system and and have a, a we have a, a sort of different levels of life licensure for providers who are providing telehealth. Um, in 2022, we also expanded the postpartum Medicaid coverage um, from six weeks, I think it was six weeks to a full year after postpartum for people who are on uh, the Medicaid program. Um, we um, uh, did a huge amount over the past two years to provide um, workforce development initiatives for primary care and other medical providers, including mental health, substance use disorder, um, nurses was a huge focus, um, but also medical technicians and other uh, and physicians, of course, um, but others who work in the, the greater healthcare system um, to provide tuition assistance, loan repayment, and training programs, because one of the biggest barriers right now to access to healthcare is workforce shortage. Um, there's there are huge waits for many many healthcare services, in large part because we don't have healthcare providers to provide those services. So we've been working really hard to try to increase um, um, the workforce in healthcare. Um, last session, we also expanded access to um, or support for um, primary mental health care, long term care, and home health and um, community based services for for Vermonters who remain in their home or um, need home health services in their home and for our de uh, designated agencies, which are our mental health agencies here in Addison County. It's the Counseling Service of Addison County. We provided an 8% rate increase for those agencies, which is a, a bigger rate increase than they've gotten for a very long time. Um, we also did work on um, improving the system of care for individuals with disabilities and individuals with Alzheimer's. Um, so those were two separate bills that we worked on um, to uh, address those two um, sort of long-term issues for a, a growing um, segment of our population. Um, so those were my top 10 um, bills that we've done in the last um, four years. Um, 
that would ex that do and have expanded access and affordability and um, quality for primary care. Um, we've also done quite a bit of work in health equity, um, working on so social determinants of health, on um, early childhood education and child care, um, student mental health, um, medical debt. As Mike um, mentioned, we did a bill on medical debt last session. Um, also child and maternal health um, and um, pharmacy regulations, which is improving access to um, uh, pharmaceuticals and reducing the price um, while also um, protecting our small pharmacies. Um, uh, that was another bill that we worked on last session um, and I could go on, but those are the top ones. Um, Linda also asked me about um, some bills that I'm personally working on or issues that I'm personally working on. Um, I am on the opioid um, uh, settlement advisory committee, um, which is a committee um, that is supposed to advise the legislature on how to use the opioid settlement funding that's coming to uh, Vermont um, as part of the big um, cases that have just been sol uh, settled um, for uh, pharmaceutical companies and um, uh, also uh, pharmacies, chain pharmacies, and their role in the, uh, their horrible role in the opioid crisis. Um, so I am uh, doing work on uh, sort of best practices and what, what systems of care we have that are working well and what we have that's not working well and what we need um, to better address the opioid crisis, which is one of the largest crises hitting our healthcare system at the moment. Um, also mental health. Um, we did a lot for mental health last ses session. We did a bill, um, in addition to raising the rates, we did a bill on school mental health and access to mental health in our education system and also um, after school. Um, and so I think that I'm uh, there'll be more work to do in that area. and. And I'm working on that as well. Um, reproductive health care access protections, um, as, as well as trans care protections. Um, we are going to be, work we already are working on, I, I have met multiple times with legislators um, who are a group of us who are working on a sort of sanctuary bills to make sure that we protect these services and for people who are coming into our state and for providers in our state who are providing these services to um, patients who are from Vermont and potentially from elsewhere. Um, one of the biggest issues that as I've been talking to people knocking on doors that I've heard and I, I've I've talked to several of you about it are the, um, the the quote unquote Medicaid Advantage plans and the advertising and the sort of in your face misinformation about these plans. Um, we have we did do a little bit of work on it last session um, and didn't really come to sort of a full agreement on what we were able to do as a state legislature because Medicare is a federal program. Um, so I know Mike is involved a little bit in that as well. So I think there'll be more work next session um, because we have just seen a huge increase in this and people are scared and worried. And I heard about this a lot from seniors at, when I knocked on doors. Um, then uh, long-term care, um, sort of broadly speaking, I think much of our medical debt in the state is because of long-term care and our lack of access to long-term care that's affordable for Vermonters. Um, more health equity um, work um, and related issues. The Senate Health and Welfare Pro uh, Committee has a broad jurisdiction. We work on health things, but we also work on things that are quote unquote sort of welfare programs. So we did a big bill last year on reach up, which greatly improved that program, which is for very poor um, mother, single mothers with children. Um, so this year, we are going to be spending a significant amount of time and a significant amount of money on childcare. Um, that is one of the major issues that we are hearing from Vermonters across the board, whether they're employers or parents or um, uh, school uh, teachers, we we just need to improve our our childcare system, um, housing, um, which is is definitely related to healthcare. If you if you don't have stable and safe housing, you are not going to be a healthy person. And Mary, I know, can speak to this directly as well. Um, and paid family and medical leave. If you're not able to take time off of work um, and be paid to be able to do it, um, you aren't gonna be able to take care of your family, whether it's a new baby or uh, a sick 
um, uh, relative or an aging parent um, or yourself, um, um, we need to make sure that people have access to paid family and medical leave. Um, so those are issues that I've been working on. Um, and um, in terms of the universal primary care, um, I have not seen Senator Bray's bill. I am not one of the people he's been working on that bill with, so I don't know what is in that bill. Um, I, uh, I'm familiar with the other bills um, that have been introduced. Um, I think we should do everything we can to increase access to primary care and affordability of primary care. Um, and you know, if we can make a universal primary care system work, I think that that is a great thing, and I'm certainly willing to try. Um, it um, It's going to be difficult with all the other um, competing priorities this session in terms of funding and time, but um, we certainly can give it our best try. <laughs> um, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Great to hear from you. Um, okay, uh, I'm just gonna, um, I'll share my screen here. Um, this in in the this uh, this August um, we um, got um, a in the Vermont uh, Democratic Party platform. There is a healthcare plank that uh, we got put in there, and I'm just gonna read to you what what got passed. Um, it's in uh, as you can see here. It's in the fourth part of seven parts uh, in the platform. And it's healthcare for all. The, the VDP supports a single payer Medicare for all healthcare system. Until federally sponsored Medicare for all legislation is enacted, Vermont must take all available steps towards achieving universal access to and coverage for high quality, medically necessary health services for all Vermonters. This includes addressing critical challenges in the healthcare workforce and provision of rural care. To that end, the Vermont Democratic State Committee supports a universally public finance system in Vermont with primary care as the first step. So we were um, very excited to get that in the platform. Um, so that concludes uh, the um, scheduled agenda. And now what we're on to is questions, answers, discussions, um, and whatnot. So um, uh, if anyone has something they uh, would like to share, um, just raise raise your um, your Zoom hand. And um, uh, I, I just think, uh, I, I also just once again want to thank everyone who shared tonight. Uh, it's all been very interesting stuff and it's amazing the group of people we have assembled here. So, uh, all right, Chris, uh, you might be on Oh, you're off. Good. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, I just wanted to thank you for the reminder too on um, the, um, that a uh, first step towards universal health care um, in form of universal primary care was um, adopted and ratified by the Democratic Party for the, the entire state. So, I think as we think about this, um, we've just seen a very strong turnout and uh, good results for Democratic Party. Not that this is entirely a party alone issue, and I think the party is speaking on behalf of many Vermonters, but I think my takeaway is that we should have a lot of confidence that this piece of the platform for the entire party also um, is something that in the vote we just saw was uh, widely embraced by, you know, 180,000 plus Vermonters. So we're, we have a lot of company um, and thanks for um, making that part to you and Linda to making that part of the state platform. There are a number of questions in the chat. Do you, uh, does somebody want to start by answering any of those? Um, any of us? Oh, I could, um, um, actually, want the people who um, said put those in the chat just raise their hand and and and, and just and reiterate them orally, uh, if that's Betty, okay. Betty Keller was one of the first people to 
to. Oh, okay. And she happens to be the next person up. So Betty, to you. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about this really important um, important public service that we need. Um, so in the chat, I put a question about why aren't we enforcing Act 48? But actually a, a question that that might be like something we don't have time to talk about tonight. But a few years ago, Deb, you had put, put forward a bill for um, global hospital budgets and having um, hospital care publicly funded. And I mean, the vast majority of what we spend in healthcare is in the hospital. And so I'm, I'm wondering why we don't, and, and as Mike said, they're really looking at global hospital budgets. Why aren't we pursuing looking at that first? Because it seems like if that's where Medicare wants to be giving waivers anyway, let's like do it the right way and, um, and not like be focusing on universal primary care while somebody else is running away with the train in the wrong direction. <laughs> Well, I, I can answer that. I, I mean, first of all, we you're right. We did try. That was H207, I believe, um, which uh, had, the advantage of that bill was that it would have reduced um, your premiums by 45% because um, your premiums actually, 45% um, uh, of your premium goes towards hospital care. Um, at the time, the legislature did not have the appetite for that, nor did they have the appetite for the, the whole system, which, again, it is a big it's a big lift. Um, you, you know, at that time, I think it was something like, I think it was a billion dollars that they would have had to come up with. The reason that un universal primary care is uh, more appealing is, first of all, it's everyone needs it. It's not just um, some people, only about 10% of the population needs hospital care at any one time. Um, so it's something that everyone needs. 100% of us need that. And, and most of it is preventive. And it is the only sector that has been shown to improve population health, which is one of the goals that Vermont has right now for their, uh, the ACO. The, the, is, that's one of the goals is to improve population health. Um, and the fact is it's very inexpensive. So you get a huge return on investment. Unlike, again, I'm not against, um, obviously not against uh, trying um, uh, universal hospital care. But again, I think that we've already been shown that that the legislature does not have the appetite for taking on something that big, but something that would be for every single constituent, every single Vermonter, that is much less. I'm not advising this, but we could do this for one and a half percent payroll tax, the whole thing, the whole universal primary care. I do not advocate that, but that just shows you that we could do that for every single Vermonter to have that. You can't say the same for that when it comes down to universal hospital care. But certainly um, I, I'm not against it. If, if the, some legislator said, yeah, we can get this through a universal hospital care with um, global budgets, that would actually be global revenue budgets because what is being suggested is not global budgets. They are, I don't know, some version of that, but I have no, I have no problem with that. But again, this just has to do with, because it is a political issue, not an economic one, it's a political issue we have to start with what is politically feasible. And that's the reason. Yeah, I'm hoping that what is politically feasible might be um, different from what it was when you were doing the hospital bill. We passed Act 48 in the meantime. So I would think that, um, you know, times have changed. Things have gotten more desperate. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And uh, we're on to Cheryl and you're on mute. Yeah, first, thank you all for doing this. It's it's amazing and wonderful data. So I'm probably dense here, but if there's legislation that almost passed a couple of years ago that Senator Bray referred to, and if this is shown to improve um, population health and we can afford it, and we have a supermajority, in both houses, what it sounds like it should be simple. I'm, I guess, I'm looking at Deb's smiling face, Dr. Deb, to say, what, you know, what's the next step here? Can I just jump in here? I, I, yes. I think that you know, I, I've heard a couple people say it's not an economic issue, and and it it, it is. It's not free, and it it is. And there is an argument about how our system is already costing X amount of money, and this is just shifting that amount of money 
to something else, but it's taking it from something, it's shifting it to having the state to pay for it. And so that is uh, where the, it, it is an economic issue because it has to be paid for out of state funding, public funding. And so then we have to come up with a system for raising the revenue to pay for the services. And at the same time that we're coming up with the revenue to pay for childcare, to pay for uh, uh, family medical leave um, and, and other priorities that we may or may not have. So I think that it is an economic issue is, is how to pay for it. And I, I don't know what the, um, the fiscal note is on this bill. I, th I think last time, Mike, was it, do you remember what the fiscal note was on? I, I was just playing with the numbers. You know, if it's 6% of $7 billion, that's $420 million. Yeah, yeah but so it's 200 million actually, because you're you're still getting existing Medicare and Medicaid funds. So it is actually 200 million in new taxes. But keep in mind that that currently, much of that is coming out of pocket. I would like to add also that let's keep in mind that how we currently fund healthcare is very regressive. So that your average Vermonter um, who who is maybe you know a CEO of a company or of a hospital is paying the same premium as the person who's scrubbing the floors of that hospital, and that is a very regressive way to pay for healthcare. I think um, that is something to keep in mind. The other thing is we already publicly fund a huge percentage of our healthcare dollar. We pay the highest healthcare taxes in the industrialized world. Um, when you add Medicare, Medicaid, what we spend for public um, finance or public financing of, of um, public in, employees, um, and then the tax shift um, that goes on uh, when employers get a pay for health insurance through pre-tax dollars. So we're already paying huge amounts in taxes. It definitely will take a great amount of political force. I have no doubt about it. But in terms of the economic piece of it, we are already paying the whole bill, and it is very unfairly financed the way it is. And it was my understanding, at least when Secretary Hogan was working on these issues, that transferring the way money is going into administrative and managerial costs down to people that are actually providing services to patients, that kind of shift, if it were possible to do, would not require any new funds. It doesn't require any new funds in total. Let's face it, what you're really asking is for the healthy and the wealthy to pay for the sick and the poor. Um, that is the, you know, the reality of it. You're taking the money from different pockets. I think I agree with Senator Hardy that, you know, it's definitely not just, oh, we're going to take this administrative savings and then put it over here where we're going to pay for medical care. It's at a system level. And you're taking the money from different pockets. You're basically saying, as Tommy Douglas said when he enforced, he he pushed for the Canadian system, we're going to get the money from the people who have it. And that's really what we have to look at in our healthcare system. We have to start paying for this in a fair way. So it isn't a direct, you know, transfer of the funds. That is absolutely correct. Okay. Um, but it's definitely in total, there's more than enough money in in healthcare right now. Got it. I, I think it's just really important, and thank you for saying that, Deb. It's it's much more complicated than just saying, "Oh, well, mm -hmm. we already spend this money, and we're just going to move that money over here and spend it in this way." It's it's a complicated shift in both how you pay for it and how you tax it. So it's this is this is not just a healthcare problem; it's a taxation problem. It's a it's a finance problem. So it, it really is much more complicated. And, and I, 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 I love this kind of problem. I'd love to be able to sit down with all the best people and figure it all out. But it is not as easy as just saying, well, we, it's already in the system. So we just like take this money and move it here from here to here. Um, and it's a multi year process. And a you know one that involves um, a, an enormous amount of heavy lifting from the executive branch, and even if we have a, a supermajority, if we don't have an executive branch that's willing to do the work, it won't get done, and it won't get done well. So that's another barrier. Just as an example, we had massive housing policy that we passed last session. 
and the way that they're choosing to implement it or not implement it is incorrect. We're basically having a hearing next week during the off session about some ways that the executive branch is implementing housing policy that is against legislative intent. So we have to also have willing partners in the private sector and in the executive branch to make a shift this big, even if it's just part of the system. So not to say we shouldn't try and shouldn't try to do it and that it's not possible, but the sort of lots of moving pieces to some change this complex. Great, uh, thank you. Um, and we're on to Walter with a question. Hey, Mark, thanks much. Uh, my name is Walter Carpenter. I live in Montpelier. Uh, I live down the street from Deb, way, right downtown. I've been a healthcare activist for many, many years, involved with Act 48, um, <clears throat> UPC, all the way up through. And I'll just, <clears throat> I've been, <clears throat> I'm on, on the advisory committee of the Green Mountain Care Board. I helped create the board. I go to a lot of the board meetings. I've been in the state house for many years, as Mike knows. And <clears throat> My question, my first statement is, is that I'm someone with one of those stories. And I once had to decide the price of my own life. And you got to think about that for a minute. And I've heard the, ar the arguments of Deb and I've heard what Ruth, Senator Hardy has said. We have 7.25, 7.65 billion in our healthcare system. CEOs make enormous amounts of money. John Brumstead is at 2.5 million. The new CEO is starting at 1.3 million. They start current CEOs at like 700K, 400K, 500K, and that's all of our money. All, you know, we're paying for you, we're paying UVM through taxes fees, premiums, Blue Cross, taxes, fees, premiums. And I think this is both an economic <clears throat> and political issue, but it shouldn't be difficult. I didn't have primary care at the time. I lost my insurance because I lost my job because the company decided to kick me out. And then I got sick again and the hospital came with a figure and we had to negotiate prices just as if you're buying a used car or in a bazaar. And I, I lived in the Middle East for a while and I spent time negotiating the prices for, for good. So this is also a moral issue. And that's what I wanna stress about this. This is a moral, it's not just economic, it's not just political. I understand the economic problems of moving one part to another. When we first did UPC, I heard that all the codes would be all screwed up. I'm wondering with a legislative majority like we have, that can pretty much tell the government, make the governor a lame duck. If we can actually do this this year, and knowing that the opposition is going to be fierce. The hospitals exert a fantastic amount of pressure on representatives and senators and, and the executive branch. What can we do to mitigate that? They have a lot of high priced lobbyists. The Hospital Association, Devin Green, Mike Del Treco are very good at maneuvering bills around. What is it, <clears throat> given that it's both a moral, moral, political, and economic issue, how can we proceed with this? Well, Walter, can I just start with a question? Did you manage to sit through the One Care hearing yesterday at the board? I missed that one, Mike. I, I, I would I would recommend that you spend a little time listening to the tape to hear 
the new chair's um, grilling of one care executives about executive pay. I think I think you'll enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, I've raised the issue before at board meetings, and in fact, I did a couple meetings ago with Owen. Well, take a listen. All right. Yeah. And, great. Anybody, it, it should be up in the next couple of days on Orca. Um, great. Thanks there is the a new up. chair of the Green Mountain Care Board, and uh, he is a federal, former federal prosecutor, and um, has mm -hmm. a different approach uh, in the few hearings that he's been a part of. So, and you I just, just say that very quick summary of that, like the, he 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 just gave a good grilling to that board, is what you're saying. He asked he asked very challenging questions uh, okay. uh, on on many many different levels. Um, about it should be noted that the just the administrative alone for one care was 18 million dollars that's just the administrative salary mm -hmm. um, I, I, I guess I want to um, I want to caution us to not think this is simple and, 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 and don't get me wrong in, in any way, I'm not questioning the, the morality or the correctness or the, or, you know, whether it should be done, um, whether we should pay for healthcare um, to publicly financed um, taxes. Um, but I, having lived through it with many of you. Um, me included. I, I, I think that we convinced ourselves, many convinced themselves that it was simple. And we already paid for it and we're just gonna pay for it in a different way. And um, including then Governor Shumlin. Now, Governor Shumlin, bless his heart, uh, was, is a both feet in kind of guy uh, without thinking about the details. And um, and so, you, you know, when, when we got to the financing plan part, um, you know, he he and the administration balked, and um, and so you know, I think you know, lesson learned. We want to do something like, thing like this, Deb. If it's four hundred million, if it's two hundred million, whatever the right number is. Um, we got to be willing to get through the financing part first. The values part, that's simple. The mm -hmm. challenge is the financing part. And I want to emphasize something that Ruth, Senator Hardy said a minute ago. I, I, I spent a lot of time watching legislative committees. And at some point in the recent years, I, the recent last couple of years, I, I sort of was, I was asking myself, hey, I sat in the chair of the health care committee. Um, I sat in the vice chair of the health care committee when we passed Act 48. How did we do it? Um, and it, it came with an administration, you know, we were working with an administration that was working with us. Heavy, heavy lifting. And, you know, and so I, I, I have in recent years watched them, the activities, no offense to anybody here. If you don't have the administration working with you, the, the legislative branch is just not equipped to do a lot of the heavy lifting. It's not. And so, you know, that's frustrating as an advocate who's saying we should be able to, you know, something way simpler than, than what we're talking about here. Why can't the legislature you know, wrap their heads around it and do it. It's 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 very hard to do, and um, and it's not just about a veto override here. It's it's about an administration that's going to dig in and do the heavy lifting with you, and then implement with you know what you what you call for. Um, and so I, I I just and I'm saying that with all honesty, we have a serious challenge with the current governor in terms of being able to do. I, I, I would like to add also that we just never think twice about increasing the amount of money that we allow hospitals to take in. 
Um, there have been times where uh, we have given them $200 million in extra spending because they just couldn't meet their budgets. And we don't seem to have any problem. The Green Mountain Care Board says, okay, no problem. Yeah. And so again, nobody is saying this is gonna be easy, but this is such a dire problem. Um, in a few years, first of all, good luck trying to find any more primary care clinicians because right now, one third of us, myself included, are over the age of 65 and retiring. And if we do not find a way to not only increase access and, and, over, and decrease overall costs, we're going to lose whatever primary care workforce we already have. So again, nobody is saying it's, I mean, of course, it's going to be tough. Of course, it's going to be tough. But keep in mind, too, that this administration isn't going to be there necessarily when we try to, to work on getting this thing implemented. So, I, I mean, again, I, I think Vermonters have taken on many, many challenges. Dr. Dinosaur, by the way, was one sentence in a piece of legislation. One sentence. We're going to expand, right? One sentence in that legislation, and they managed to get it done. Look what we've, this one care thing is a monstrosity. You can't get more complicated than that. Yet we've shoved all kinds of money in that in their direction. Millions and millions and millions of dollars. No questions asked. I do think we can get this done. It's going to take, there's no two ways about it. It's not easy, but yeah, it's the best be, place to start. Just because you, you you did a shout out about nobody nobody's opposing hospital budgets. My team is opposing, has opposed every hospital budget with as much voice as we have. Um, but you're right. We've lost in those battles. Yeah. Can I just offer a quick, I, I don't see a, a such a, separation between the money and the values piece now like i think we express our values through money and sometimes we need to lean in to a question and invest and i think there's there is um an endless number of ways to uh, avoid leaning in and um making a, a commitment uh through uh seemingly reasonable financial considerations. Harold Guyard, who preceded me in the Senate, used to say, there are advocates who will come into your committee room and sometimes they just walk you into the swamp and they drop you off. Um, and I feel like we run into this on complex issues like healthcare, uh, energy, climate change, et cetera, that the, there can be uh, crippling complexity introduced so that in the end um, we don't make changes that we need to make and so uh, if i sound a, uh, a little impatient i think it's probably like other people here now after you know 14 years um i would like to see us somehow break the paralysis uh, on that side so great thank you um i think we're going to move on to ellen now yeah, I just wanted to point out, um, you know, it's already been said, you know, we're paying the entire bill already, right? Um, and every time a budget goes up, we're paying more through our premiums or out of pockets. Uh, we do appreciate there is a political issue in raising some of that money from publicly raised funds as opposed to a premium. I did want to raise a couple of things. Number one, um, I think an important part about raising the money publicly for primary care is then that amount of money could no longer be charged by your insurer because the insurer by statute cannot charge you for services they are not paying out for. So, you know, primary care is only 6% of um, total spending. I wouldn't sell it as, oh, hey, your premiums are going way down, but we could certainly say, you could advertise that it will be a break to a, a little bit of a break on the premiums going up. Secondly, I want to say about complexity. Huh. Does anyone understand all this? One payer risk adjusted capitated model, the ACO, value based care. I mean, we have been through so much. I would say about 1% of Vermonters understand the, you know, rigmarole that's being invented. And now we, we're gonna have value-based player and global hospital budgets, which by the way, 
How does that work with a multi-payer model? I get it with a single-payer model. You fund your hospital as a public good. But a global hospital budget with, you know, um, team payers, that's going to be Byzantine. So I do think we have to consider that we do take on uh, and so often create um, unnecessary complexity. And I don't mean to say that universal primary care would be simple politically, but we can all understand it. We can understand we raise the money publicly, we pool it, and then primary care is a public good without, you know, umpteen payers. That seems easier to me at least to understand than the ACO and the value-based payments and risk-adjusted capital and then all the other stuff uh, that, you know, gets thrown around. So I do think it's worth trying, and I applaud Senator Bray for taking this on. And I also think people will be behind you if you're a legislator. The people will support this. And so I think, yes, it will take some work. And I'm not saying it's easy, but I think we shouldn't give up because um, maybe some of the powers that be will push back, but you may get a lot of support from people like the people in the Zoom room tonight. And, you know, part of our job as citizens and also our representatives, you know, we can gather that momentum and hopefully make, make it happen. Thanks, Ellen. Um, and I think we're on to Deb, Deborah Ramsdale. Hi. Um, I just wonder, well, you know, you mentioned um, Dr. Dinosaur. Couldn't this be like Dr. Dinosaur for everybody? See, hey, why not? <laughs> Deb, Dr. Deb? Yeah, I, I mean, you mean uh, like a doctor, like basically Medicaid for everyone? The, the only um, problem I think we, we might have if we sort of use that as our um, uh, definition, because that's a Medicaid program, um, would be the fact that you would have to um, increase the uh, reimbursement to primary care because if, uh, when Dr. Dinosaur happened, actually there were many um, practices that actually went out of business because they couldn't afford to stay open if everyone had, a, had Medicaid. So yeah, I mean, you could call it that, I suppose, but if that has to be, it has to be somehow sustainable to primary care practice. Um, so uh, yeah, I think what you're suggesting is like a, everyone, again, as long as there's um, um, adequate reimbursement, so, so practices are sustainable. They don't have to be profitable. They have to be at least meet the fixed costs of the um, uh, primary care practices. So I, I guess I didn't yeah. know that yeah. Dr. Dinosaur was a Medicaid program. Yeah. Because my, my grandchildren are on it. And um, yeah. aren't, aren't it, all the children in Vermont on it? No, no. It's up to, I think, I think it might be 133% of poverty. Um, Three, 300. Is it 300? Okay. That's right. That's right. It is, is, which is how much? Uh, I don't know. It's don't a medic. It's because... It, Dr. Dinosaur is Medicaid, which means it's it's more than half of it is funded by the federal government. And that that is a big factor. And that mm -hmm. is a big difference between that and funding of universal primary care that wouldn't necessarily, there would be some federal funding, um, but not half, more than half of it, like me, Dr. Dinosaur and Medicaid. I'll Medicaid is $1.8 billion. Uh, is the Medicaid budget approximately, and more than half of that is paid for by the federal government. Uh huh. Interesting. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, I think we're on to Marianne. Hi. Um, hi. Um, I when I got onto this call. All I could think of was Bill Scott. Oh no, <laughs> how could we ever, you know, how could it ever, you know, pass? But um, I was wondering, my question is, is there bipartisan support for this kind of program? And um, I just noticed in the most recent election, I saw a lot more <laughs> signage for Republicans and it felt much more polarized um, than ever. And I was just wondering if there was work being done to find bipartisan 
support for this because I mean, it just seems ridiculous that this would be a democratic issue. Well, Tapper McFawn was um, in favor of it. He's a Republican from Barrytown. Um, and um, we've had bipartisan support. We, we've sort of had this bill uh, introduced sev several times and there has been actually tripartisan support for it. It's not huge Republican support, but um, even um, Heidi Schuerman, when I spoke at a Rotary Club, um, she came up to me right after, uh, this was several years ago and said, I think this is a good plan. I, and she even had done without health care and had problems paying her own health care bills. And um, Heidi is, um, you know, certainly not, you know, she's as conservative as, as you can get, but she was in and favor she, of this well. So, and so yes, very there, there has been. <laughs> right. <laughs> she's very wealthy. I know her. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah, okay. I know the, anyway. so. <laughs> but she, but anyway, she was in favor of it. She um, was, was, uh, you know, thinking that she wanted, she didn't want to be sort of coming out of the closet to, to do it. In other words, she was worried about saying that to her colleagues, but she did say that to me personally. Um, so it's not, it's not something that, um, and business people again are, are um, like the idea of it because their employees would um, have access to, to primary care, which, you know, especially if you run a restaurant, you know, and somebody has a cough or a fever and needs a flu shot and whatever, they would be able to access that without um, having to worry. So um, yes, there has been tripartisan support. Great. Um, I think we're on to Chris. Um, thanks. Yeah, you know, just very briefly, the, I mentioned Dr. Dinosaur not as an exact model mm -hmm. um, or analog, like, oh, that we will expand that, but in part just to remind us of that we can fall into a mindset of thinking that it's we can't get this done because it's too unusual, it's too big a lift, it's too complicated, there are too many parties with vested interests. Um, but we have been able to create a really meaningful program in Dr. Dinosaur and, and figure out how to manage it, how to run it, how to finance it. And um, I'm just citing that as a reason for us not to sort of beat ourselves down before we even get started uh, the next session. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and Sh Cheryl. I, yeah, thank you, Chris. I'd, I'd like to put an example in from the other end of the H span, too, at the pretty much at the same time that we did Dr. Dinosaur, and we were able to really increase the levels of family income that could be covered. There was also a big movement to say most of our older Vermonters don't want to be living in nursing homes. We want home-based care. And we were able to accomplish um, with Choices for Care that same kind of major dramatic change against the very strong lobbies of the nursing homes in, in pretty much the same fashion. So I applaud um, Senator Bray for just reminding us that if we put our minds on what's the morally right thing to be doing, we can probably do it. Hey, thank you, Cheryl. Um, I think we're, uh, we're 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 sort of past time, anyways, and uh, I think this is good time to wrap up. Unless anyone has anything really urgent they want to add here at the end, um, and I just want to thank everyone for coming to to talk, and it, it was really great discussion. Um, really great to hear from everyone, and. Um, just want to thank everyone and thank thank you, Linda and everyone for organizing this. Mm -hmm. And um, this is great. And uh, uh, let's let's keep the conversation going. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Yeah. So uh, thanks for reminding me that as I have a bill drafted and to share, I'll get back to you and Linda, and um, so that we can, uh, you know, share what's in development with this group of people and more broadly. Happy to have. You know, we, we have a, a, a great history of having people come together, think about problems together and find ways to get to uh, yes. So um, I'd like to continue to be part of a much bigger group that has a lot of experience to help shape what gets introduced and developed and investigated, not knowing where it will land, but um, that we can look into it together. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.